38 years ago, in August 1982, the ColecoVision was released on the still nascent gaming world. Released around the same time as the Atari 5200, the ColecoVision's hardware was designed from the ground up to be able to be more accurate in recreating home versions of arcade games than its competitors. It did a pretty solid job of this right off the bat with the best home version of Donkey Kong shipping as the original pack-in game. Yup, its first release was actually a Nintendo property. The controller was a sign of its times, though. I don't know what it was about the early 80s and the number pad controller configuration, but the Coleco went with the standard established with the Intellivision and followed by the Atari 5200, just with its own unique setup. A raised control knob at the top of the device was used for directional movement, two side buttons as fire triggers, and then the number pad below. Most games don't use the number pad for anything more than selecting players and difficulty at the beginning, though the asterisk and pound sign tend to be reset or restart shortcuts in many titles. Personally, I find this better than the Intellivision disc and the 5200's non-auto-centering stick, though having to use a grip motion to press the triggers tends to weary one's hands quickly. The cords are pretty short too, but since they follow the DB9 standard, extensions aren't too difficult to find. Aside from the controller, you have a cartridge port on top, a rather unique sort of power socket for the external brick, an RF port, and an expansion slot. I've had mine modified by NES Matt here in Milwaukee, adding AV output and... God, I never thought this would be something I'd miss, but he also added a lovely blue power LED. Otherwise, there's no real indicator to show that the console's powered on if you're having output issues. Speaking of that expansion slot, the Coleco had a pretty insane batch of additional devices that would expand its functionality. The rather mundanely titled Expansion Module Number 1 was nothing short of an Atari 2600 clone, complete with controller ports, a cartridge slot, and all the necessary buttons to be able to play games for that console, adding a massive additional library playable on your powerful new machine. Expansion Module Number 2 didn't use that slot, but was instead a steering wheel controller for use with games like Turbo, Destructor, and Bump and Jump. One brilliant thing about this device is that while it plugs into controller port 1, you can clip in controller port 2 into the slot where the pedal is stored to use it as a gear shifter in compatible games. Fascinating. And you take over his That's computer. Incredible. Now, command the powers of Adam, the power of a complete computer system, all in one package. Expansion Module 3, the only one I don't have, was actually a full microcomputer upgrade referred to as the Atom. It adds memory, a keyboard, and the capability to attach a printer or tape drive to the base unit. If I ever get my hands on one, I'll definitely revisit this, as it could probably field an entire video on its own. Moving back to the original machine, we have two more peripheral goodies in the roller controller, which was only specially compatible with the game's Slither and Victory, but could be set to a sort of joystick mode for other titles. 
and the Super Action controllers, which sported four triggers and a more arcade-like joystick on top. This is cool, but I'll still never understand why Spy Hunter is compatible with this and not the steering wheel. As I mentioned, the ColecoVision's strength was really clear in its arcade conversions. Donkey Kong, Time Pilot, and Tapper. Though the arcade game that clinched the ColecoVision over the Intellivision for me was Rock and Rope. I've got some fond memories of that arcade cabinet, and this is the only console of its time to get an arcade conversion. It's got a bunch of other great titles, too, including one of my favorites from the Commodore, Jumpman Jr. Overall, the graphics are pretty solid, the sound is well done, and the ability to handle graphics with low amounts of sprite flicker was referenced by Takao Sawano and Masayaki Uemura as the standard for how they approached the architecture for the Famicom and later the NES. By the time it left the shelves in 1985, the ColecoVision had sold a modest 2 million units. It's not too difficult to find today, and the games tend to be pretty easy to source as well for not a lot of cash. Ant Games had a crack at the Coleco back in 2014, with a flashback version of the console that included 60 games, including a few bits of homebrew and some of the more rare titles on the console, including Fortune Builder and Oil's Well. It also included all the appropriate controller overlays for each title as well, Sadly, those controllers aren't cross-compatible with the original machine, despite maintaining the DB9 standard. I hope you've enjoyed this look at the ColecoVision on its birthday this month. Got any fond memories of this lovely device? Tell me about them in the comments below or on Twitter at Tesseract Unfold. Meanwhile, please like, subscribe, and spread the word. And I'll catch you guys all again next week.